Okay, our first speaker uh, this, after, this morning is going to be Dr. James Norcross. He's the Director of Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery, Texas Health, Heart, and Vascular Hospital in Arlington, Texas. Dr. Norcross. Well, thank you for asking me to be here. The, uh, uh, I, you can tell I didn't pick this uh, topic. Um, this was a sign, but I, I was working hard at it. We went out last night, it was my birthday, and so unfortunately I can tell you we did not solve this problem. So I have no disclosures other than hemonetics asked me to speak for them from time to time. So just laying the groundwork, in 2012, 85 million units of blood were transfused worldwide. The practices, however, continue to vary widely amongst programs and hospitals, and this variability is not a new problem. In fact, if you look in a paper in 1991 in JAMA, you can see the distribution of uh, transfusion in 30 first-time coronary bypass procedures at these 18 different institutions. And based on that, people were becoming more aware of the problem. However, in 2010, another paper in JAMA just recently showed that not much progress had been made. You can still see there's this wide variability, that's red cell transfusions in uh, isolated cabbage patients and 600 uh, institutions with as many as 600 uh, uh, patients still had uh, quite a variability. There tends to be less blood used in, in the high volume places, but it's still quite a, a scatter. The other uh, slide on the left lower one is FFP and uh, platelets. So you can see the distribution uh, is, is pretty varied. Transfusion rates in the UK and in the United States vary from 25 to 75% in the UK and 8 to 93% here. However, we are making progress. This is the Blood Centers of America uh, tracking the quarterly demand. This is just from blood banks that, that report to the BCA. But you can see there's about a 12% decrease over a three-year period there. So people are becoming more aware, I think, as surgeons and perfusionists, and we're constantly trying to, to be more uh, conservative in, in uh, transfusion. What you've, there's a lot, been a lot said recently about restrictive and liberal thresholds. Uh, restrictive thresholds, typically, the, uh, they try to maintain hemoglobin levels above seven to seven and a half, so uh, a lot of us would consider that fairly liberal to begin with. And the liberal threshold of keeping people above a hemoglobin of nine seems to be uh, very liberal. Why do we worry about transfusing? Well, as you know, if you look at the patients, uh, this is a combination of two studies of 593 patients, and these are patients, mainly Jehovah's Witness patients, who uh, refuse surgery, and once the hemoglobin level gets below six, there's a dramatic increase, as you can see, in mortality. Um, it goes from 7%, at, at a level above seven, it's only 0.9. Above six, seven, once you get below six, at 11.7 and so on, and no one survived, obviously, with a hemoglobin of less than two. I don't think that's a big surprise. Um, so how safe is blood? Well, it's gotten a lot safer, for sure, in the 70s, the chance of getting hepatitis B or C was about one in 100 units. Now it's uh, uh, about one in, in 30 to 250,000 units. It used to be the mean number of cells you got uh, in 
the 70s was four units, so you had a 10% chance of seroconversion if you had heart surgery. HIV also, when that came around, was a, a big scare, but now it's maybe as low as one in two million. Still, the blood is not entirely safe. As we know, there's viruses always present that we're discovering. 50% of harvested blood units now have transfusion transmitted virus, and CMV is probably present in as much as 100%. The bacterial infection risk is highest with platelets, uh, largely because how they're stored, but even that is only one in half a million units. The major problems we have now are with the uh, immunosuppression effects of receiving transfusions. That's been improved by leukoreduction. Uh, trolley, which is now one of the major things actually we worry about and hemolytic reactions. If you look at this slide about the fatalities reported to the FDA, and I, I would assume these are underreported because only 30 uh, were verified as, as probable fatalities due to transfusion in 2014. And of those, 13 were trolley. Um, TACO, or transfusion-associated cardiac overload, uh, was the third most common in 14 and 15, it actually was the second most common, and then hemolytic transfusion reactions, either ABO incompatibility or non-ABO compatibility is the other major thing. So blood is pretty safe, but this, this landmark study from 2012 showed a lot of the uh, side, or a lot of the complications due to transfusion. This was a retrospective study, 15,000 patients who'd received one unit of blood, and they matched uh, almost 12,000 of these uh, pairs. And as you can see, it was a, a huge uh, study, uh, but it was observational retrospective. And they reported significant differences, as you can see, in wound problems, pulmonary, renal, cardiac, sepsis, and certainly a, a strong uh, mortality difference as well. So based on that, that again was told people that we need to try and avoid transfusion. However, there's another side to that coin. Pre-op anemia in cabbage patients uh, is a big problem if the Euro score of the patients, uh, 2,000 patients was less than four in, in this uh, big study. Outcomes, non-cardiac outcomes were worse, but if the Euro score was greater than, uh, than four, there was an increased incidence of all post-operative uh, events. Mainly renal and cerebral were the two most common things. Cardiac, they also saw, but they thought that they were often due to multiple factors. So this uh, author cautioned against the indiscriminate application of transfusion sparing strategies, especially in older patients. Another kind of landmark paper in 2015 in the New England Journal was a paper out of the UK. They had 2,003 patients with hemoglobin hemoglobin levels less than nine. These were post-op cardiac surgery, and they were then randomized into liberal or, re or restrictive transfusion strategies. So again, if they had hemoglobin uh, levels of less than nine, if they were in the liberal group, they got blood. If they had hemoglobin levels less than seven and a half, they got uh, blood. There was a little bit of the, the surgeons uh, or the physicians could uh, not choose to uh, transfuse them if they were stable. But the, the interesting finding was that restrictive transfusion policy was not superior to the liberal threshold in regards to post-op morbidity, total costs or ICU stays. Uh, there was no difference in the primary outcomes of ischemic events, MI, stroke, anything like that. Um, total costs, ICU stays, but they did see a trend towards increased mortality in the restrictive transfusion group. 
So they concluded that patients with cardiovascular disease may represent a specific high-risk group for whom more liberal thresholds should be recommended. So based on that, I mean, I think we can see that there's still a lot of variability in how much blood we should be giving. Um, everybody's trying to use uh, less blood, have a more restrictive transfusion uh, uh, sort of threshold, but particularly in high-risk old patients who have renal problems or cerebral problems, maybe those patients should have a more liberal threshold. And obviously, the, we, if we're operating on 85-year-old 50-kilogram ladies who go in with a preoperative hemoglobin of nine, they're going to get blood. So if accepting that, then the question is, why do these patients bleed? We all know these things. I mean, you have patient-dependent factors. Uh, if they've been on antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulants, if they have uh, poor liver function or they're redo bypass patients or bad tissue or they're very frail, uh, Surgery dependent, you know, is the, uh, are they having a complex operation? Are they getting grafts? Uh, are there technical issues where they need a few more stitches placed? Bypass dependent problems uh, you guys uh, all are very familiar with. Um, you can have problems with consumption from the surfaces, the mechanical breakdown, cardiotomy suction hemodilution and all, uh, loss of platelets and factors, fibrinolysis activation, temperature problems, uh, metabolism, electrolyte problems, controlling calcium and acidosis. And we do all these things uh, that we can. We stop uh, bad agents. We used to think uh, that aspirin was the worst thing. Now it's mainly the other antiplatelet therapies we try and stop ahead of time. During surgery, try and keep the patient warm. Sometimes uh, uh, people are doing acute normal volemic hemodilution. Um, other centers are wrapping patients when they go on bypass. Uh, those probably both help some. Uh, we use hemostatic agents. Uh, some surgeons and perfusionists like to wash the blood uh, through the cell saver prior to returning it and uh, other people like to return the blood before washing it to get more factors and platelets. So we're trying to do all these things. As far as the pump setup, we've gone more to closed circuits, centrifugal pumps. Uh, everybody, I think, is using cell savers. And some people, uh, uh, I know of some surgeons that aren't even using pump suckers. I, I don't know if that's a good idea, but... Um, so we have all those things we're doing. We always use, uh, in our place, uh, uh, Amacar. Um, we, in high-risk patients, we used to use a protonin uh, in the early 2000 era when it was available. Um, I think that helps. Um, dealing with uh, anticoagulation with uh, ACT and HEPCON uh, uh, levels and, and heparin levels and, and using the rapid tag in surgery is, is uh, all things that we do. Um, and obviously the other things, monitoring temperature, bicarb, calcium levels. So why do they bleed? Well, obviously they develop an imbalance between bleeding and thrombosis. That's usually due to problems uh, primarily with platelets uh, or factors or sometimes even the surgeon needs to put more suture in the patient. As far as how to treat them and get the patients back in balance, as we're gonna see, uh, you know, we all know we can use these different blood products, FFP, platelets, cryo, factor seven, factor nine, concentrates, profile nine, um, Sometimes we have to break down as surgeons and put in more stitches. But obviously there's those patients that we come off bypass or we've done things and just every little needle hole is bleeding. I mean, they, that's not a suture problem. It's, but sometimes to get out of the OR, you have to end up putting a lot of little fine sutures in just while you're trying to solve the issue. 
And in the old days, when all you had were routine coagulation tests, uh, INR or a PTT, platelet counts, ACT, you really were kind of shooting from the hip. We used to, uh, when I was in training, I think anyone that had a long bypass time or was bleeding, we'd give two units of platelets, two units of fresh frozen plasma. Well, a lot of those patients were getting unnecessarily transfused, and a lot of them came back for bleeding. So I don't think that was really a good systems. A, a better way is to do a global assessment of, uh, and we use thromboelastography. As far as what the literature says, uh, this paper out of uh, Canada showed that there was no relation at all between uh, activated PTT and uh, anti-10A activity after bypass. So basically, there's no reason at all to really be getting activated PTTs in the unit. It's just, if they're elevated, those patients, if you do anti-10A levels, which is the gold standard for heparin presence, uh, there's no correlation whatsoever. So if you're giving uh, protamine for elevated PTT, you're, you may be causing more bleeding due to protamine's antiplatelet and anti uh, uh, heparin effects, I mean anti-coagulation uh, uh, effects. So um, there's really no predictive value of INR, PT, fibrinogen concentration, and PTT levels uh, in, in, in patients and uh, as far as predicting who's going to have bleeding after bypass. I think that's the issue. So in terms of how to deal with bleeding, I think obtaining timely information, um, laboratory versus point of care. Uh, the, we have still the, our analyzers are in the lab and we have them tied into the OR in real time. We're trying to get the new analyzers, which are truly point of care and can just be in the OR, and they do away with a lot of the unnecessary uh, pipetting and stuff that, that introduces uh, a chance of error. Um, but it does provide a global analysis of, of what's going on with, uh, with bleeding rather than isolated tests. Helps you to over, uh, avoid over-treating patients which can cause short-term and long-term problems. So bypass is a necessary component of cardiac surgery in, in a lot of cases, even in off-pump, uh, it's, it's available as standby. It affects hemostasis. Improved bleeding management requires getting information in a timely fashion. Global hemostasis monitoring, I think, is far superior to than isolated tests, which don't have any correlation. And if you can develop and follow blood product replacement algorithms, you're going to save a lot of uh, problems. I've been personally using TEG in the OR in all patients since 2004. Platelet mapping came aboard in 2006. Uh, the learning curve for the people involved is very quick. Uh, it's easy to interpret. The acceptance has been excellent. Um, and really, the analysis that you get becomes indispensable for dealing with these patients. You do reduce bleeding problems and transfusion rates. When we first started it in one of the hospitals, we had a 58% reduction in overall transfusion. Uh, and that really included all products, I think especially one thing we found was FFP was really being overutilized, uh, uh, but really platelets and cryo as well. Bringbacks uh, have become extremely rare, less than 1%. And I would just close by saying that, you know, trust, trust the results you get. When you look at the curve, if it's, if it's an appropriate curve and no one has bumped the machine, and I guess this point of care uh, analyzer does away with a lot of those little issues, but trust the results. The, the test is valid, they're reproducible, 
And when you start bleeding uh, uh, in a patient that initially seemed dry, it'll tell you what you need to be uh, doing to correct that.